it's great to see you. Special service obviously today for both Ben, James and Hazel. And the baptism service is starting at 3 o'clock. And um, there will be a lot more chairs and a lot more people as well then as well. So you're welcome to come along again, especially Ben and James. <laughs> And uh, join us this afternoon. This afternoon will be followed after the baptism service with like refreshments and drinks. So please stay after us as well if you possibly can. It'd be great to see you. Services this morning led by John this morning and this evening by Benjamin Saunders. Um, he comes from Bradford, but I don't know any more about him than that, so I've never met him before. So it's a, someone new, a new face this evening. I also go on Tuesday with my dad. And um, Wednesday mornings, coffee morning, and the Wednesday club will be back with the children Wednesday evening at 6 o'clock. This Thursday is our monthly communion service at 7.30. Please let me know if you plan to come. Just make sure I've got enough tables and chairs around. So please let me know if you come on Thursday the communion service. And just for your prayers, that doesn't affect most of you. There is an hours meeting for the church leaders on Friday evening. Uh, next Sunday morning, we've got Matt Neil in the morning, and uh, uh, Matt Baker in the evening, which is none of you face to me, names, so all change at the moment. It's great to be with us, have you here with us this morning, especially on this Sunday when we remember God's Holy Spirit coming for the first time. Also, your prayers continue to thank God that Jones can do to improve, and hopefully he should be coming home tomorrow. Continue to remember others in the church as well, health issues at this time, we need our prayers this morning. So thank you very much everyone. When people used to say they came from Bradford, I thought, well, that's a long way away. I thought I'd be in Yorkshire somewhere. <laughs> until <laughs> until <laughs> the, the penny dropped that it's Bradford on Avon and not Bradford in Yorkshire. Let's just come to God in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for the reminder in those words we've just been singing that you are a God who holds us fast. We acknowledge that if it was dependent upon us, we would soon let go. We confess before you that often our, our, our love is cold for you, but thank you, Lord, that your love for us is continuous. We thank you for that love that drew salvation's plan, that sent your only begotten Son into this world to die on that cross so we can be forgiven, so that God's justice and be satisfied. And we thank you again for that work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that one who quickens us, who brings us to new life, and who works in us and, and shows us more of yourself. And we pray, Lord, this day, that we may be, be aware of his working in our hearts and lives, and in your church here, and in your church around the country, around the world, Oh Lord God, we pray that we take the things of the Lord Jesus Christ, he will make them real to us and glorify his name. Lord, we ask and pray this. And we do pray to especially for those who are being baptised today. We pray you'll be with them, you will help them. Maybe if they're feeling a little bit nervous that they will know your presence with them. And we pray again that you will be honoured in all that is said and done. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's open with our sing with our first hymn, number 55. Uh, in our hymn book, we give immortal praise to God the Father's love for all our comforts here and better hopes above. He sent his own, his own eternal Son to die for sins that man had done. <laughs> Reading through the, uh, the uh, Acts chapter 2 earlier this week, uh, you notice that even in the day of Pentecost, it's a Trinitarian God who is at work. It's God who sends the promise of the Holy Spirit. Peter preaches about the Son and, and, the, and again that, um, that the Holy Spirit at work in the lives of the Christians. Number 55. <laughs> Yes. 
singular or plural, there's one in the crown as well. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> do you like waiting? Okay. Waiting for something you're looking forward to, like a birthday or holidays. I like waiting for holidays, or used to. And you might say to mum and dad, how many sleeps is it before it's my holiday or my birthday? or Christmas, or something like that. Well, after the Lord Jesus rose again from the dead, he showed himself alive to his disciples for 40 days before he went back to heaven. But he had given them a promise, and he promised, to, promised them that he would send the Holy Spirit. They didn't know when this would happen, but they knew it would soon. And earlier, before Jesus was crucified, he had taught his disciples who the Holy Spirit was, taught him about him. Do you have a special friend? Do you have a special friend? Uh, you know, husbands and wives should be a special friend to one another, shouldn't they? Uh, but if that special friend had to leave you, perhaps they move away to a different place. Or a really nice teacher at school. Some of them are nice, you know. And, uh, and they're leaving. And it's a very sad time. Uh, and you have to say goodbye. Well, at first, the disciples were very sad that Jesus had to go away from them. They must have thought, what are we going to do now that Jesus is, is leaving us? Who is going to help us? And Jesus said it was necessary for him to go away uh, so that he could send the Holy Spirit. Just, and just as God, the fa Father is God and Jesus is the Son of God, he is God also, so the Holy Spirit is also God. We can't see him, but he is a real person. And, and, then, and he comes to live inside those who believe and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and helps us to live uh, to please him. Now when Jesus was on earth, he didn't have a body like you and I have, Cornelia. Didn't, oh, I'm sorry, he did have a body like you and I have, with arms and legs and eyes and a nose and a mouth. Uh, we don't know what he looked like because the Bible doesn't tell us. But he had a body like yours and he could only be in one place at one time. He, he couldn't be at school and at church at the same time. He had to be in one place at the same time. But when the Holy Spirit came, then he would be with all those who believe in him, all down the centuries, wherever they are. And also, one more thing we're going to say about the Holy <coughs> Spirit. He helped those first disciples, Peter, James and John, uh, and they were called apostles, he helped them to write down the words that Jesus taught them. Help them to remember what Jesus had said. And we have their words in our Bibles. Especially, we have it in the New Testament part of our Bibles. You know, I've got a book here about the Queen. Some people have had this book. And there's a picture of the Queen on her coronation day. And she's holding this long thing called a scepter and this thing here called the orb that has a cross on the top I believe they are, they are symbolic actually I don't even realise that but that stands for the world and, that, and the cross on the top st uh, stands for Jesus having, uh, being, having all authority over the world but in those, those um, things that the Queen's holding there in our coronation there are some very, very valuable jewels. In fact, they probably don't know how much they're worth. They're so valuable that there's the biggest diamond in the world in that sector. Do you know, when the Queen was crowned, something else was given to her. And the man who gave it to her said, this is the most valuable thing that this world has, this world affords. There are the words there on the screen. And he was talking about the Bible. God's word is the most valuable thing. 
far, far more valuable than any of those precious jewels that the Queen was holding. I'm going to sing about that now, just a little chorus. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, the best book to read is the Bible. And we'll sing it through twice. Him being delivered 
by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. You will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out the, this, which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children, and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he testified of testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptised, and that day about three thousand souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and of theirs. <coughs> then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among them among all, as any one had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favour with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Amen. Let's uh, come again now to the Lord in prayer. Remember some of the <coughs> needs around us. Gracious God, Again, we come before you this morning. We are very conscious of the world in which we live, a world in which there is war, in which there is famine, in which there are many social problems even in our own country. We think of the migrant crisis, we think of problems with the NHS, we think of the problems in government. Yet also we, we come with, with you for, in thankfulness for all that you have done in this nation over many centuries. How the gospel has been brought to this land and freely preached 
over many, many years. And we pray that that will continue to be so, Lord. We do pray it will not be restricted. But we pray that your church will grow in this land. That your Holy Spirit will revive your church. Although the day of Pentecost perhaps was a one-off occasion, yet we know that from time to time, your church has been revived in the centuries. And many have come into your kingdom. And Father, we pray, Lord, for our Queen. We thank you for her. We thank you for her service, uh, her faith in you. And we pray for her, Lord, that you will draw near to her at this time in her life. Pray in her frailty she will turn unto you. We pray, Lord, for, for her government. We pray, Lord, for the laws that they make. You would overrule, you will guide. We pray for Christians within Parliament. Even Christians within the royal household who would help them in their testimony to you. Lord, we look again upon our world. We see the war in Ukraine. Lord, you know all, all things. You are working out your purpose in, in all these things. But we do pray that this suffering will soon end. We pray for all those who have been displaced, those who are refugees in other lands now. Again, that you will draw near to such and help them. We pray, Lord, for those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake in many countries of this world. Places like Nigeria, like Iran, like, like China, Myanmar. We pray that you'll be near to your people there. You'll help them to stand. May they know you holding them fast. And Father, again, we Pray for those here within our own fellowship, those who are suffering in different, different ways, perhaps through bodily pain and ailments, <clears throat> simply through age maybe. Do you pray you'll be near to them? We thank you for those who have known a measure of recovery. We thank you that Joan is back at home now. Would you pray for your continuing recovery for Carol? We think of uh, Jackie and Via. Pray for his treatment that he is having too. To that Nigel and his family have recovered from COVID and we do pray, Lord, for others too, Lord, that you will be near to them and cause them to seek your face. And Lord, we do pray for the preaching and teaching of your word today in this place and other places around our land. You remember Andrew at uh, Whitter, Whitbourne this morning and at West Lavington this afternoon. She'll be with him as he shares your word there. And also as Carrie shares her testimony to the people of West Lavington. So continue with us now, dear Father, as we meet around your word and sing your praise. We ask and pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's turn again to our in books to number 720. There is a Redeemer, Jesus God's own Son. <coughs>
Father, help us as we come to your word. Quieten our hearts and give us attention to what you would say to us. May the words of men be hidden and forgotten, but may that which is truly of yourself go with us through this day and through the days of this week. We ask and pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. She's done a good job. That's what uh, a, a boy was, uh, 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 he was asked by an interviewer on the mall on, on last Thursday, I think it was, what do you think of the Queen? And she said, well, she's done a good job. God save the Queen. And I think we would agree with that, even if we aren't a monarchist, I think we would agree that she has done a good job over, the, over her years of self-sacrifice and service to this country. But in contrast to that, in the era in which we've lived, most of us have lived through the, uh, the, the reign of Elizabeth II, we have seen so many things happen in our land where people have become self-centred instead of God-centred. We've seen the decline of morals and many other things which sadden us. And we might say to us, we might ask ourselves, would I, could I change society? Could I clean up TV, for instance? Mary Whitehouse tried that a few years ago, and brave and courageous as she was, it never really changed things. Uh, could I re reverse the moral decline in the land? Could I end the war in, in the Ukraine? Perhaps, ch perhaps the government in Russia could be changed and they will have a different, a different view of things. Could I help the immigrant crisis? Could I help broken families? Well, Today, as we've been saying, it's about when the Holy Spirit first came upon the church on the day of Pentecost. And we might ask, what's that to do with changing society? Or is it to do with something else? And I think it is that something else, first and foremost. In verse 40, we read these words. Peter was urging his, the crowd there. He was saying... Be saved from this perverse generation. Other translations have crooked generation or corrupt generation. I think that's probably a good translation, corrupt generation. Be saved from this corrupt generation. <clears throat> well, before we come to that, I think we must just go back a bit and look, and look what's happening on that um, first day of, uh, of Pentecost. Firstly, we must look at the preparation for it. Uh, it's going to be quite a few P's this morning. Whenever I think of words all beginning with the same letter, it, they usually are begin with a P, so there are going to be a few P's. And there has been a lot of preparation for this Jubilee, hasn't there? Many plans have been laid for that. And also even for the Queen's coronation back in 1953, there were many plans secret plans, even the, her um, coronation <coughs> gown was made in complete secrecy, even the workers who made it didn't know what the other people were making, the other parts, so that it wasn't until the complete gown was uh, made that they saw the, the whole thing. And the, and the timing, down to the very last second when the Queen arrived at Westminster Abbey. But God also has been preparing, not only did he prepare for Easter, uh, but also for Pentecost. And we, we know, we read uh, one of the Old Testament prophets there in Acts 2, the prophet Joel. He prophesied what was going to happen in Pentecost many hundreds of years before. But also, even in Israel's annual feasts, God was preparing for Easter and for and Pentecost. Um, those annual feasts. Firstly, there is the Passover feast, which coincides with our Easter time, particularly with Good Friday, when the Passover lamb was sacrificed, and the Lord Jesus Christ fulfills that. He was the Lamb of God, slain from before the foundation of the world, when he shed his blood for us. And following the Passover was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That follows on immediately after the Passover. And uh, we, we learn that uh, in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, on the 
day after the Jewish Sabbath, which would have been the Saturday, then they offered the first fruits of the barley harvest. And uh, when Jesus rose again on that first day of the week, on the Sunday, he was the first fruits of those who had been resurrected again at, at his coming again, at his resurrection, as Paul shows us in 1 Corinthians 15. But also, there is a connection with Pentecost there, because on that day of the first fruits, that Sunday, the Jews had to count seven weeks plus one day, 49 plus one, 50 days, when they would celebrate the first fruits of the wheat harvest, when cakes of unleavened bread and other sacrifices were offered. And we can see in this a picture of the great harvest that God was beginning to bring in on that first day of Pentecost. So even those annual feasts, God was preparing his people for what was going to happen in many hundreds of years before. But also there was a preparation going on in the lives of those disciples. Remember they lived with Jesus for three years, they had served a, an apprenticeship if you like with Jesus and in those 40 days after the resurrection he appeared to them many times. He gave them many infallible proofs that he was alive. Also Luke tells us he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures at the a lot of it was perhaps a mystery to them up to that point, like those two on the road to Emmaus. Jesus opened their understanding. And then he gave them instructions about what they should do when the Spirit came. That they should preach repentance and remission or forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And, and lastly, they were told to wait. To wait for that promise of the Father. And the promise is repeated in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. And that's a key verse for the book of Acts. It sets, as it were, the program out. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Like when you throw a pebble into a pond and the ripples spread out. And the ripples of that gospel have been spreading out down the, the last centuries to this present day. But secondly, it was a promise fulfilled, verses 1 to 4. And we see how those disciples, they were met together and they were of one accord. There was a unity between them, which probably they had never known in the, in the past. And we see that the Spirit came, he came with, with sounds. And with sights, he came with the wind. And we know a bit about the wind, don't we? It can be very powerful. Uh, it can blow down fences and even brick walls. I've seen it twice in my lifetime, demolish a brick wall, back in 1987 and more recently. So the Holy Spirit is powerful. But also he is invisible. We can't see the wind, can we? Uh, and yet it is still powerful. And the Holy Spirit's work in a person's heart, in the people who will be baptised later on today. It's an invisible work. It can't be seen. Jesus said to Nicodemus, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it. You cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. John chapter 3 verse 8. And then we have the tongues of fire, uh, divided tongues over each of the disciples. And what does that speak of? Fire speaks of God's purity or of his presence. Uh, remember God in the burning bush when he appeared to Moses. Uh, and when Mo he told Moses he was on holy ground. You know, did you know that each of us can play a wind instrument? You see, our voices are a wind instrument. It starts in our lungs, and the airs go over whatever it is, the vocal cords and the larynx and all that kind of thing. Uh, and we use our tongues and our teeth and our jaws. It's all part of this wind instrument that God has created. 
It's a marvellous thing, isn't it, when you think about it, that he, he has created our tongues, our voice. Of course, we can misuse our voice. James tells us about that in James chapter 3. On the one hand, we can praise God, but on the other hand, we can curse man who is made in the image of God. But here in, in Acts chapter 2, these, these disciples, probably, probably all of the disciples, not only the apostles, were given that ability to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They were known languages, the languages of those people listed there. Uh, it was a marvellous miracle. The Tower of Babel was reversed. And perhaps part of those greater works that Jesus promised to his disciples in John 14 verse 12. Of course today we have to translate uh, the Bible into other languages, into the mother tongue or the heart language like um, Carrie has been doing in Indonesia. But then thirdly, we think about the people who were present at that uh, gathering in, in Jerusalem, verses 5 to 13. Uh, that they were amazed at what was happening, that these Galileans, these un unlearned fishermen, who had this ability to speak in their own language the wonderful works of God. I think it's important to notice that these men, most of those who gathered there, were Jews uh, dwelling in Jerusalem. They'd probably been staying in Jerusalem for some time. One source tells us that they were expecting the imminent arrival of the Messiah. And many were probably there those 50 days before when Jesus was crucified and rose again. And Paul, uh, Peter addresses them in verse 14. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem and who knew all about Jesus of Nazareth, verse 22. They knew about those things. So Peter could latch on to that. These Jews and their proselytes, that is those who become worshippers of the one true God, we read that they were devout men from every nation under heaven, every known nation around the Mediterranean world. So they were sincere in their worship of God. And they were familiar with the Old Testament. Perhaps they had the Old Testament in the Greek translation, the Septuagint, but they knew what Peter was talking about when he preached to them that sermon. And then we think about the message that Peter preached verses 14 to 36 go for it fairly quickly but first of all just think Peter was a different person from before the crucifixion he was bold but not only was he bold he had a, a different relationship with his fellow apostles disciples for we read that he stood up with the, uh, the eleven not against them often in the past he may have argued with them and wanted to be be, be first. Anyhow, let us just notice some things about <coughs> Peter's message. Firstly, Luke tells it's an edited version, like many of the sermons that Luke, <coughs> the writer presents us in, in the book of Acts. Because uh, we read in verse 40, it was with many other words that Peter spoke. So we just get perhaps a, a, a summary of what Peter preached. And firstly, he preached. Might sound simple, but down the centuries, God has used the foolishness of preaching to bring people his good news. No gimmicks, nothing like that, uh, but just the simple preaching of God's word. There have been great men who have been preachers, and there have been many unknown men as well. Men we can think of in, like in the evangelical awakening in the 18th century, like uh, George Whitfield and John Wesley, or we think in the 19th century, like men like Spurgeon in London, or in the 20th century, men like Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones in, in London. God has used the preaching of his word to bring people to himself. But secondly, it is God's penned words, and I mean by that, of course, the Bible, the scriptures. We saw how uh, he, he quoted from Joel, and beginning, uh, it, it shall come to pass in the last days, says God. And I, I believe that the last days began 
uh, at Pentecost and will go until the end of time, until Jesus comes again. And he, he quotes from Psalm 16, uh, referring to uh, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And lastly, Psalm 110, the most quoted psalm in the New Testament, and speaking about Christ's position in heaven, uh, uh, at the right hand of God, that place of all authority and power. And then he goes on to say, This Jesus whom you crucified is both Lord and Christ. <clears throat> so if preachers are to be God's spokesmen, we must make sure that our source is God's word. It's not our own opinions, our own views. God's word. And these crowd, they knew, this crowd, they knew the Old Testament, as we said. They knew something of it. Uh, but later on in the book of Acts, uh, uh, we read about Paul visiting Lystra, uh, Gentile nations, in Acts 14, and then in Athens, chapter 17. And he met people where their understanding was. It, they didn't have all the background that um, these Jewish people had. Yet still he, 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 he taught biblical truths, uh, like those people in Athens, in, in Acts 17. The third thing we can say is that Christ was paramount. He was central to what Peter had to say. Peter reminded them about the facts about Jesus' life, his life and death and resurrection and ascension. You know, Peter once, had to, uh, once came to Jesus to try to turn him away from the cross. But now he is able to say, this is all part of God's eternal plan to save the people for himself. Yes, those people had a responsibility for the crucifixion and he's not, a sh not shy in telling them that. But it's also God's pl plan from before the foundation of the world. And Peter goes on to show from scripture, scripture that it was not possible that death should keep its hold on Christ but that God raised him up, and that we are all witnesses of that fact. You know, one of the proofs that people give us of Christ's resurrection from the dead is the fact that, that not one of those apostles went back on their witness to Christ's resurrection. In fact, most of them were probably martyred. In the word witness can also mean martyr. And then Peter goes on to speak about the present position of Christ at the right hand of God. So he's building up a picture for them. To reject this Christ is to reject the one who is both Lord and Christ. He is the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth. He is the one who's fulfilled all those Old Testament promises, prophecies about the coming Christ. And you know, Jesus said to his um, disciples about the, about the Holy Spirit, that it is the Spirit who glorifies Christ. John 16, verse 14. It, some have said he is the gentleman of the Trinity, almost in the background, but it, it is his role to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. And fourthly, Peter's message was persuasive. He wasn't aloof. To, to people, he identified himself with the crowd he was speaking to. Men and brethren, he, he, he came from verse 29. He was warm and he was earnest in his preaching to them. You know, uh, later we read in, in Acts of, of Paul how he reasoned with people, Acts 18.4, and disputed and persuaded in Acts 19. But it was not a cold reasoning about man's philosophy. Uh, just as uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones was described as his preaching was logic on fire. And I believe that was the same with Peter and Paul. They were concerned that their hearers wouldn't go on in their own way, even if that way was a sincere way. It was a road, a broad road that led to destruction. And fifthly, it was personal. Yes, Peter identified with those people, but he didn't pull any punches. He applied it to them. You men of Israel, you have taken that the Christ had crucified them. And sixthly, it was in the power of the Holy Spirit. The, the Victorian preacher, uh, C.H. Spurgeon, 
When he used to climb his pulpit there in the Metropolitan Tabernacle, he used to say this to himself, I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit. He realized it wasn't his eloquence, his preaching alone, but it was the word must be joined to the Spirit. All the reasoning in the world, all the passion in the world, cannot change a person's heart. Because the Holy Spirit was at work in these people, then the people were persuaded, verses 37 to 41. Verse 37 tells us that they were cut to their heart, or as it is in my old authorised version, they were pricked in their heart. Now the Holy Spirit is the surgeon. He shows us our sinfulness. You know, King David knew that after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba. For nine months he his conscience was silent and then Nathan comes along and gives him a parable and God the Holy Spirit takes that word and applies it to, to David's heart and he realises how he has sinned against God. Now there are many nice people around, many our neighbours, they're very kind to us, very friendly and say nothing against that. God knows our hearts, he knows the things that are deep inside them. He knows that they need to change. And we need the need to come to that place where they're like those people on the day of Pentecost and they say, men and brethren, what shall we do? A surgeon wounds in order to heal. And God's wounds are to lead us to the remedy. And Peter applies the remedy here in verse 38. Repent and be Repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission or for the forgiveness of sins. Repentance is a change of mind. We've been going in the wrong direction. It's turning us back to God. It's being sorry for the wrong way we have lived our lives and for our personal sins. We could misunderstand Peter by thinking that... Uh, he is saying that baptism will save us. And baptism is important, don't get me wrong. It is a command of the Lord Jesus. And I trust it will be a blessing to those who will be baptised today. But um, it is that but an outward sign of God's work in our hearts and lives. There's no, no, no magic in the water. It's still water all the time. But... It's, it's those who profess repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and being willing to yield in obedience to him. Now, lots of Union Jacks fluttering around at the moment. don't know uh, if people are, how, how sincere their um, support of the Queen is, but they are a sign of allegiance to the Crown. And one, one aspect of baptism is to show those who have been, been baptised, to show their allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. He has died for them. And they want to submit their lives to him and follow him. But the act of baptism itself does not save us. We read in verse 41, they, they received Peter's words. And in verse 44, they believed. And it means that, uh, that those who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ save us from sin. We all stand condemned before a holy and just God. We cannot make ourselves right with him. You know, it's, it's, it's if, uh, well, that's not a very good illustration, but it's if the judge, we were standing before the judge, and the judge's own son, the one who had perfectly obeyed his father, has gone into the dock and said, I will take the punishment penalty for their sin. In exchange, they are clothed with that perfect righteousness of the Lord Jesus, of the Son. And the judge can look at the sinner and, and, and forgive them and account them as righteous. And they can say, I have been saved from sin's penalty. But there are two more tenses to that word saved. In verse 38, we're told about the gift that God gives to those who believe that you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And no believer 
is perfect in this life. We still fall, we still commit sins, but we can say, I am being saved from the power of sin. It's an ongoing work within our lives, the work of the Holy Spirit to make us more like the Lord Jesus. It may be painful at times when the, the Lord has to discipline us for things in our lives which need to be put right. And then lastly, when we reach heaven, I will be saved from the presence of sin. So Peter is aware of his listeners that they are heading for a lost eternity unless they repent and believe. And so with many other words he testifies and exhorts them to save themselves from this corrupt generation. And our generation is no less corrupt than Peter's generation. There was a man called John Harper. He sailed on the Titanic and we know what happened to the Titanic. Um, John Harper was a preacher of God's word. And he found himself in the icy waters and he came across someone. And he, but this was not the time for niceties and politeness. He said to him, are you saved? And the man said, I don't know if I'm saved yet. And then they were separated and they came together again. And John Harper asked him again, are you saved now? And again, they drifted apart and John Harper drowned. But that man was rescued. He was saved not only physically from the sea, he was saved spiritually too, because later on, I think it was in Canada, he was to say, I am John Harper's last convert. So it's the same question that Peter asks, are you saved? Saved from your corrupt heart? Saved from this corrupt generation in which we live? And saved from an eternity separated? Lastly, Jubilee celebration. Those last few verses of Acts chapter 2. Now a Jubilee, according to a dictionary, is a special anniversary. It's a joyful celebration. But also it adds this, which is interesting for a, a, a secular dictionary. In the Old Testament, a year of rest to be observed, a Jubilee was a year of rest to be observed by the Israelites every 50th year. 49 years plus one, during which slaves were to be set free, alienated property restored to its former owners, and the land left untilled. And on that first day of Pentecost, 3,000 souls, they were set free, they weren't set free from physical slavery, but they were set free from spiritual slavery. And we see in that last verse the kind of attitude they were praising God and having favor with all the people yes the time was going to come when they would be persecuted but as the church began they had a favor they were in favor with everyone and the Lord added to the church daily such as were being saved and we also see their generosity verse 45 how that they sold their possessions and goods and parted to all men as every man had need. So Christianity is not first and foremost about changing society, but it's to change people's lives from being a self-centered life to a God-centered life. Christians are not of the world. We serve a different king and we're in a different kingdom. But Christ has sent us into the world. John 17 verse 18. And one of the effects of changed lives is to act as salt and light in the society around. And many Christians over the centuries have been involved in making changes to society. Let's come to our final hymn, number 514. It speaks of the work of the Holy Spirit within. Born by the Holy Spirit's breath, loosed from the law of sin and death, now cleared in Christ from every claim, no judgment stands against our name.
Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Amen.